Welcome to the Vitec self-paced tutorial series, Foundations of MBSE, From Concept to Reality. I'm Zane Scott, the Vice President of Professional Services here at Vitec, and I will be your host for these sessions. We have chosen to call this series, Foundations of MBSE, From Concept to Reality, because we will explore the foundational principles of model-based systems engineering in a way that ties the concepts that they embody to the real world environment of our design process. If you are relatively new to systems engineering, we have presented here what you will need to know to establish a firm conceptual foundation on which to build your practice. If you are a more seasoned practitioner of the discipline, this series will provide you with an opportunity to realign your practices and processes with the fundamental principles of systems engineering. Our experience across years of consulting and design work has shown us that very often the difficulties and problems that arise with systems designs stem from not having paid enough attention to the basics. Just as athletes return again and again to the fundamental blocking and tackling skills we all need to visit and revisit our foundational principles in light of our experiences. It is our hope at Vitec that this series will create that opportunity for you and that you will see again the power of systems engineering from its foundations. So let's get started. In session one, we will begin with the nature of systems. We will look at the definition of a system and explore the criticality of the relationships which bind the elements of the system together. We will talk about how a system produces results and the dangers of breaking the elements apart, either physically or in the way we view the system. We will wrap up our discussion with a consideration of the necessity for taking a system's view and the impact of failing to do so. Our study of model-based systems engineering must begin with the question, what is a system? The object of any kind of systems engineering is, of course, systems. That is the beginning point for our inquiry into the nature of model-based systems engineering. The International Council on Systems Engineering defines a system as a construct or collection of different elements that together produce results not obtainable by the elements alone. It is important to note from the outset that the systems can be composed of more than hardware and software. One of the most overlooked components of a system is often the human actor. In the system depicted here, the hardware defibrillator visible in the x-ray is governed by the software programmed to fit the individual in which it is implanted, but the human heart to which it is connected is definitely an element of the system and must be considered in the design and operation of that system. There are three aspects to the definition which merit special notice. The first such aspect set out in the INCOSI definition requires that a system contain different elements. This means that a single element cannot comprise the system in and of itself. As science advances, we find that almost everything in our world can be decomposed into a set of constituent parts. That means that almost everything in our world is in some sense a system. But for our purposes, we will use the definition to limit our consideration to elements at the lowest level of our decomposition, while acknowledging that nearly every system is in reality composed of a number of subsystems, which we are treating as component parts. We will refer to the constituent systems as elements. Please note, we often recognize the fact that we can decompose elements of a system, thus making them into systems in their own right. We call this a system of systems or a system composed of subsystems. Often these two terms are used interchangeably. 
but there is a useful distinction between the two. In a system of systems, the individual lower level systems are configured to optimize their own performance without regard to the others. In a system composed of subsystems, however, these subsystems are optimized for the behavior of the larger system of which they are a part. But in either case, these lower level systems are elements in the larger system under consideration. The second aspect calls for a construct or collection. This implies that there is some structure to the system that holds the elements in relationship to each other. This structure may have been designed into the system through a known process or might simply be found in the system in nature. We will set aside the question of whether the existence of a coherent structure in a discovered system implies a designer and we'll leave that one to the theologians. In most cases, we'll deal with systems which have been intentionally designed by human designers in a note and setting. But however, this structure has come to be such a structure as must exist in a system. The structure gets its shape from the ways the elements are linked together. We call these linkages relationships. Finally, and most importantly, a system produces results which are not obtainable by the elements alone. This happens through the relationship and interactions of the system elements as they relate to each other, as defined by the construct which holds them. That interrelationship or interaction produces results not possible, either by the elements acting alone or at the same time, but without the relationships defined by the structure of the system. The biologist Fritjof Capra views systems in this way. According to the systems view, the essential properties of a system are properties of the whole, which none of the parts have. They arise from the interaction and relationships among the parts. These properties are destroyed when the system is dissected either physically or theoretically, into isolated elements. Although we can discern individual parts in any system, these parts are not isolated, and the nature of the whole is always different from the mere sum of its parts. Capra, who is perhaps best known for his 1975 book, The Tao of Physics, was at that point a particle physicist, seeking to describe the parallels between the principles of particle physics and Eastern mysticism. Subsequently, his interest in the properties of systems and the interrelatedness of the physical world has led him to the study of living systems and ecobiology. He sees and articulates clearly the systems considerations that a variety of scientific fields share in common. He is the author of a number of books and of the screenplay for the movie Mind Walk, which was directed by his brother, Berent Capra. That movie tracks an intellectual dialogue applying the principles of systems thinking to a wide variety of disciplines, from particle physics to public policy. In his work, Capra focuses on the nature of interrelationships within systems. It is those relationships which produce the properties of the system. It is those relationships, therefore, which are the essence of the study of a system, whether as an ecobiologist, a particle physicist, or a systems engineer. In every case, the key to understanding the system is understanding the relationships. Capra's latest book, A System's View of Life, lays out his understanding of that study and is a very worthwhile read for anyone seeking systems knowledge. There is nothing new at all about this idea. It is a part of a number of ancient wisdom traditions. The Sufi poet Rumi says, you think because you understand one 
you must understand two, because one and one makes two. But you forget that you must also understand and. Rumi puts his finger exactly on the principle here in identifying the fact that the property of the number two comes not from the properties of the number one, but from the very nature of the results of its combination with another instance of itself. The process by which systems manifest properties or results that are not possible for any of the system elements alone is known as emergence. The system properties and results are said to emerge from the interrelationships and interaction of the system's elements. A good illustration of the concept of emergence is the music produced by an orchestra. Each of the instruments has its own particular sound or set of sounds. As the orchestra plays the notes that compose the piece of music, the score defines the ways in which the system elements relate to the others. Tempo, volume, and pitch are the parameters within which the instruments produce their sounds. No single instrument in the orchestra could produce the sound of the orchestra playing together. Stitched together by the score and the conductor, the orchestra produces a sound beyond the capacity of any individual element of the system. The sound emerges from the combination of the instruments. A skilled composer understands the way in which this emergence occurs depending on how the instruments are combined. Soft strings and muted horns produce an entirely different sound from the rousing tones of unrestrained brass. The composer uses her experience with the many possible relationships and conversations to select the desired sounds for the composition. In every case, the music that emerges is the result of the interrelationships of the instruments and the notes that they produce. The illustration of an orchestra contemplates a composer skilled enough to set the relationships of the instruments to produce an intended result. This involves using emergence by controlling it to produce an intended result. But emergence can quickly change from a dutiful servant into a petulant trickster. The right or intended sound depends upon the ability of the composer to account for and design the orchestral relationship in order to produce a particular effect. An inability to exercise this kind of design control can result in the wrong or unintended sound. Unplanned relationships or interactions will produce unplanned results. In the world beyond the carefully crafted orchestral score, these are known as unintended consequences. It is said with considerable wisdom that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it is getting. Examining this reveals that the bad or unintended results are the results of a bad, perhaps unintentionally bad, design. Getting a system design to reflect the designer's purpose rests on the designer's skill at crafting and controlling the system relationships and interactions. If this is done well, what emerges will be consonant with the designer's intentions. Done poorly, it will result in an unintended consequences where desired properties or results fail to emerge while undesired properties or results manifest themselves. Emergence is truly a two-edged sword. Managing it successfully requires a true system knowledge of the design space. An example of unintended emergence occurred in the process of China's Great Leap Forward. One of the problems facing the Chinese government in their Great Leap was the issue of food shortages. The shortages in grain crops were traced back to the consumption of significant portions of grain supplies by sparrows. The Chinese government sought to counter this problem by offering a bounty on dead sparrows.
This strategy took advantage of China's large population of relatively poor people who would be enticed to kill significant numbers of the grain-eating sparrows. The strategy was initially successful as large numbers of sparrows were turned in for the bounty. This significantly reduced the amount of grain lost to consumption by sparrows. However, the strategy produced a new problem in the form of an unintended consequence. The Chinese problem solvers had failed to consider that sparrows consumed not only the grain supply intended for human consumption, but also eat large numbers of insect pests. The large-scale slaughter of sparrows, therefore, produced an overpopulation of the insects. This made it necessary for the Chinese government to launch a campaign to eradicate the insect pests. This was accomplished by distributing pesticides, which reduced the insect populations. However, once again, the strategy failed to take into account all of the potential ramifications of the insect eradication. Not only were insect pests eradicated by the poisons, but insect pollinators, like honeybees, fell victim to it as well. This meant that food crops went unpollinated, resulting in crop shortages that approached the levels of the losses originally attributed to the sparrows. This series of unintended consequences had brought the Chinese people right back to their original position of food shortages. The lesson here is that it never pays to fail to consider the systemic nature of problems and solutions and their effects. It is only by taking the system's view and understanding the interrelatedness of the parts of the system as a coherent whole that we can hope to avoid the significant unforeseen consequence of symptomatic treatment. Otherwise, what emerges from the system may not be at all helpful to our cause. In order to understand a system, we must take a system's view. This is a view that encompasses all three aspects of the system, the elements, the structure, and the system results produced by relating the elements to each other through that structure. This view gives us insight into the system and what it can deliver. In our next session, we will see how that insight is critical to the task of the systems engineer. We have seen the importance of a systems view in understanding the system. The system properties we seek are the products of the relationships and interactions of the elements. Without a robust systems view, we cannot hope to see the system or its results. As Fritjof Capra warned us, the essential properties of a system are properties of the whole, which none of the parts have. They arise from the interactions and relationships among the parts. These properties are destroyed when the system is dissected, either physically or theoretically, into isolated elements. Taking anything less than a full system's view dissects the system and deprives us of the, our understanding. Next time, we will advance our understanding of the system to include its fundamental structure from which it produces its results. We will then discuss the nature of systems engineering and how it differs from its sister systems disciplines. We will conclude with a discussion of the basic task of systems engineering and tie it to the importance of the systems view. So we will see you next time.